Thanks, Andrew. Um, Andrew, as he said, has known me for many, many years, and I know he probably had much more embarrassing stories than me getting stuck in quicksand, so I appreciate him taking it easy on me and focusing on the science part. Uh, thanks to all of you for being here. Um, the work that I'm going to talk about is really a culmination of many years of work, uh, but the overriding theme is what we tried to do is incorporate concepts and principles from animal ecology and evolution and, imply, and apply those concepts to infectious disease control. Particularly the type of diseases that we focus on, oh, this totally worked before, oh, there, uh, are endemic and emerging zoonotic diseases. So these are diseases that originate in animals and are transmitted to people occasionally. Um, so we know a couple of really important examples of the, these things like uh, HIV, which originated from non-human primates, uh, SARS coronavirus, which likely came from bats, uh, and avian influenza, which as the name implies, obviously came from birds. So those are some of like the, the really well-known examples, but more broadly, we do know that around 70% of emerging human viruses or emerging human diseases come from other animals. And so when we think about how do we want to control these diseases, it's actually quite complex because just the process of emergence itself is complex. In order for any disease to emerge, it has to be maintained within some wild animal, has to be transmitted between species, and it needs to be able to infect that second species. And so that's already some complex ecology there, but, and that challenges how well we can predict disease emergence between species. But it also offers several opportunities, because we can basically intervene at any one of those stages. So for example, uh, if we wanted to intervene within the natural reservoir, we could do things like culling of the natural host, or, or we could potentially vaccinate the natural host. If we wanted to intervene at the second stage, we could try to do things like educate people to prevent them from uh, risky behaviors that might lead to contacts with wild animals. So this is a picture of me in the Peruvian Amazon with a baby coati. Maybe not the smartest thing to do from a public health standpoint. We could also decide that we're not going to be able to do either one of these things. We can't control it within the natural host. We can't stop people from interacting with wild animals. Uh, but maybe we can just vaccinate people. We can vaccinate domestic animals so that when they inevitably do get exposed to these diseases, sorry, the PowerPoint is kind of going crazy, um, we can stop them from getting diseased, from actually getting infected. Let me just check something. It might be on like the auto advance. So when people go out and try to control these diseases, there is often a real desire to intervene at this stage, like within the natural reservoir. And the reason for that is kind of obvious, that if you can eliminate the disease from the natural host, then that's a long-term solution, and you don't have to be endlessly vaccinating people or domestic animals, uh, which has a, kind of an ultimately high cost. The problem is that we often have to do these interventions without strong scientific evidence of how they're going to work. And so for that reason, we see plenty of examples of things like culls, uh, so killing animals, trying to reduce disease. Uh, in cases where there's really mixed scientific evidence, no scientific evidence that it could be effective, or actually culls carried out, which are in contrast to the existing scientific evidence basis. So if we want to do these things better, we need to start understanding more of how the diseases are actually working within their natural host. And so that's really the topic that I'm going to talk about today. Uh, in the first part of the talk, I'll be focusing on vampire bat transmitted rabies, which is the work that Andrew mentioned in Peru. Uh, and in the second part, I'll be shifting gears to a much broader uh, scale of analysis where we're thinking about uh, how we can infer aspects of the ecology of host virus relationships directly from viral genome sequences. So the first part uh, will be quite a lot of mixture of methods, so longitudinal field studies, some epidemiological modeling, some population genetics, and even some analysis of large-scale interventions. And in the second part, it's going to be focused on machine learning and viral genomics. So vampire bat rabies, this is a picture of the va common vampire bat and its distribution throughout Latin America. You can see it's quite widespread. It's also a habitat generalist, so you can find it everywhere from tropical rainforests to uh, inter-Andean valleys in the Andes Mountains, uh, all the way to arid coasts on the Pacific side of South America. It's a real problem because, as the name implies, it's a bat that feeds exclusively on blood, and it feeds routinely. So every night or two, this animal is feeding on the blood, mostly of other mammals. And so, as you can imagine, that creates an incredibly high force of uh, exposure between species. So literally, there's hundreds of thousands of these bats that are biting hundreds of thousands of other animals every single night. And so for that reason, we see thousands of cases of livestock rabies happening every year, because this is a virus that's transmitted in the saliva. That ends up being a cost of at least $30 million every year, um, just in terms of like dead cows. Uh, there's a whole lot of other costs associated with surveillance and diagnostics, 
but this is just the, the kind of the crude estimate of how many cows are dying. Um, and that's predominantly affecting small scale subsistence agriculture. So this is hitting the poorest people in some of the poorest countries in South America. Uh, in terms of human rabies, it's also now the number one source of human rabies mortality throughout much of Latin America. Uh, and so that's just a picture of a child with a vampire bat bite on his head. So as I mentioned, the, the virus is transmitted as the bats feed on other animals. It's also transmitted from bat to bat when the bats bite each other aggressively. So how do people actually go about trying to control this disease? Uh, one of the ways is using population control of the bats. Uh, there's a very clever uh, kind of transmissible poison called vampiricide. Uh, the way it works is pretty straightforward. It's an anticoagulant poison. And you treat a bat, you go out and catch bats, you smear this poison on them, and because these bats are highly social and they groom each other, other bats are going to ingest the poison off of the first one. When they ingest it, all of them will die. So that has been done throughout Latin America since the 1970s. Uh, but there's really no clear evidence yet that it's actually working to reduce the amount of rabies transmission. So when I started out during my PhD, I really wanted to ask that question. Like, does culling actually work to reduce rabies transmission? And the way we set about doing that was initially to start out a long-term monitoring study. Uh, and at the moment, we're working in all of these different po points across Peru, uh, which cover the coast, the um, Andean valleys, in the center of the country, uh, and the Amazon rainforest. And so in each of these kind of habitat types, we have multiple sites. In each of those sites, we're doing kind of mist netting, heart trapping. And we're catching bats. And somewhat uniquely for, for vampire bat rabies, we're able to do a long-term market capture study. And I say uniquely because usually when people kill these bats, they, sorry, when they catch these bats, they kill them. Uh, because they are seen as an undesirable pest species. But nevertheless, we've persisted and we've been able to do market capture over, at this point, almost 13 years. And one of the things that we do is collect a blood sample from those bats, and we use that blood sample to test whether or not they've been exposed to rabies before, uh, and that's using a virus neutralization test. So we can basically do some lab work, and it tells us if they've been exposed probably within the last uh, four to six months. So that gives us some pretty unique insights into... Maybe I'm just going to switch. It gives some pretty unique insights at both the individual level and the bat colony level. So here you're seeing uh, individual bats that were recaptured through time over a course of about a decade. And so we can kind of see their individual status and whether they're exposed to rabies, uh, how long they have antibodies, so forth and so forth and so on. And then, of course, at the population level, we can see these kind of big changes, fluctuations in seroprevalence, which probably correspond to the virus uh, being introduced into those bat colonies. So with those sorts of data, I first wanted to ask, well, does it actually do anything, does culling actually do anything to reduce rabies? Uh, the first signal we had that it might not be doing much for rabies transmission uh, was just looking at the relationship between the size of these bat colonies and the seroprevalence to rabies. So this is kind of a measure of how much exposure is happening in that colony. And you can see there's really not much of a positive relationship there. And this is kind of no matter how we analyze it, this wasn't significant. So that already points out the, the concerning possibility that if you artificially reduce colony size, you might, not, uh, you might not reduce the amount of rabies transmission. And so then, sure enough, when we compared colonies that had never been culled, that had periodically been culled or regularly culled during the course of this initial four-year study, uh, we saw that culling either had no effect at all or might even in some cases be increasing the amount of rabies transmission. So this was the first indication that, rabies, that culling might not only be ineffective but could potentially be counterproductive. So in order to understand that a little bit more, we needed to do more than just observational studies like this, which have lots of explanations. Uh, so we first shifted to doing some mathematical modeling. And this is work done primarily by Julie Blackwood and my uh, PhD supervisor, Pedge Rohani. And we basically developed mathematical models of rabies transmission. And we used both our serological data from the field studies and also some uh, data from the literature to parameterize these models. And we compared a bunch of different types of models, which in the, for the purposes of this talk, they don't really matter too much, except to say that all of them gave us the same primary conclusion, which was that the basic reproductive number of rabies was always estimated to be less than one. And so we know from uh, basically core epidemiological theory that if the R0 value of the disease is less than one, that means that uh, any individual bat is, not, is unlikely to transmit it to more than one other individual. And so that means that the, vi the virus is very unlikely to be persisting in the bats over long timescales. And in this case, they were all kind of substantially less than one. 
And so that implies that the only way for rabies to really be persisting over long time periods uh, is for the virus to be using multiple bat colonies. So any single colony can't maintain the virus indefinitely, so you need multiple colonies. And so that really points to the possibility that rabies is persisting over long time periods by extinction recolonization dynamics, or maybe metapopulation dynamics. And so that doesn't directly tell us about why culling doesn't work, but the moment we understand that the disease works through metapopulation dynamics, it really raises some questions about how culling could work. Uh, and in any, a lot of ways, it's analogous to this game of whack-a-mole, where you've got these moles that pop up, and the idea is to whack the moles uh, as they're popping up. And in the case of rabies, we basically have a disease that's appearing somewhat sporadically, or at least unpredictably, on the, ra on the landscape. And our uh, intervention is usually reactive or just kind of randomly allocated. And so it's very unlikely that we're going to be able to control the disease in this way, because we're always going to be lagging behind the epidemiological dynamics. There's also the additional complications in the real world that if you cull a bat colony right after it's had a rabies outbreak, you're likely to be killing off individuals that survive that outbreak and probably have immunity. So that's not great for your disease control either. Uh, and the other possibility is that by culling, you could actually induce dispersal of the bats. So they're not going to like it when all of their roost mates are dying. Uh, and so in that way, you might actually facilitate the spread of the virus. So all of that um, was not great news for the potential efficacy of culling programs across Latin America. Uh, but at the end of the day, it was all pretty much based on theoretical models, which we tried to use the most data we possibly could. But it's still not always clear how that's going to translate to real world impacts. So what we really wanted to know was, is culling actually going to reduce the amount of rabies transmission from bats to livestock or people? And so more recently, we've had the opportunity to test that by collaborating with um, the regional government of Aparimac, which is this uh, uh, department in the southern part of Peru. It's right next to Cusco over here and Ayacucho on the other side. Uh, and in this area of Aparimac, they invested quite a lot of money into a large-scale bat culling program, which was carried out over about two years. And so in this map, you're seeing a kind of blown up version of uh, that region of Peru. And in the red, you see the districts that were part of the culling program. And in the black, you see uh, just where all the rabies outbreaks were. So you can see the culling program was quite extensive in scale, but didn't cover all the areas that rabies was circulating in the region. In terms of what they did, they hired around 15 people. These people worked for two years, and they caught bats, and they applied the vampiricide gel to just over 21,000 individuals. Uh, that's not to say that they killed 21,000. They probably killed far, far more than that, because I mentioned before it's a spreadable poison. Um, but this is far above and beyond their, their typical control measures. So we thought this was a nice chance to see when there is a really intense intervention, does it do anything? The other unique thing that they did in this case was to monitor things quite well. Uh, they monitored bat population size roughly, at least using a proxy, um, which was the uh, amount of bites of bats onto livestock. So by routinely going to farms, you could ask them how many cows are getting bitten, uh, and so forth and so on. And then we also were able to obtain data on rabies incidents through the National Surveillance System of Peru. And so together, this let us ask this uh, previously unresolvable question of, does this sort of large-scale, long-term intervention do anything when it comes to reducing rabies transmission? So first of all, we just wanted to see, did the culling actually work? Did they reduce the bat population? Uh, this is a figure just showing the percent of animals bitten through time. And you can see that starts off around 25% and goes down to around 10%. So a reasonable reduction, uh, convincing enough evidence that they had reduced the size of the bat population in some measurable way. But when you looked at the percentage of farms that still had bat bites, it didn't change that dramatically. So maybe from 70%-ish to 60%. So basically, most of the places that had bats before still have bats. It's just that there's fewer of them. So given that there was at least some sign that the bat population was diminished, we could next look at whether that influenced the amount of rabies transmission to livestock. So here, you're just looking at the time series, the number of monthly rabies outbreaks, both in districts that were culled and districts that were not culled, uh, before, during, and after the culling period. And so the first thing to point out, most obviously, is that there's still rabies transmitting after the cull. Um, but if you kind of squint, you might imagine that there's less rabies here than there is here. And that really raises the question, though, can we attribute that potential decline in rabies incidence to culling, or is that just part of the natural disease cycle that's going on in this region? And so to answer that, we needed to do more than simply look at the time series. Um, so for, 
we ended up using uh, something called Bayesian state space models. Uh, this is a collaboration with my former postdoc, Julio Benavides and Lafalda Viana, who's here in the audience too. Uh, and we fit basically a spatiotemporal model to that livestock rabies time series. And that model was able to incorporate a lot of different temporal, spatial, temporal and spatial effects, as well as culling effects. And so what I'm going to show you here is the, the posterior estimate of the effect size uh, from that model. Uh, and so any time the, uh, the confidence interval on that uh, estimate overlaps with zero, it's going to mean that effect really wasn't important for explaining the dynamics of rabies in this area. So first of all, not surprisingly, we see temporal trends. So this is quite intuitive. All it really means is that if you had rabies in your district in the previous month, you're likely to have rabies in the current month. And similarly with a lag of two. So two months previous also heightens the risk. We saw perhaps even stronger spatial effects. So this is the same sort of idea, but looking at a neighboring district. So if a neighboring district had rabies previously, then you're likely to get rabies in the next couple of months. But when we then looked at the culling effects, we saw basically nothing. Uh, they were all sitting right on zero. And so this was the first true empirical evidence that culling wasn't doing much to reduce the incidence of rabies in livestock. So that's all kind of bad news for how effective culling might be. But it does, on the positive side, reinforce uh, our previous ideas of how rabies is working uh, through spatiotemporal processes. And just to illustrate what I mean by that, uh, here you're seeing a video of the uh, like a sliding window of kernel density estimates of livestock rabies outbreaks through time. Uh, and so you can basically just see the virus jumping around quite a lot on the landscape. And you can see in some cases there's kind of like almost predictable traveling waves of the virus through these Andean valleys. And in some cases it kind of pops up seemingly at random in different areas. And so this for us has really highlighted that if we're going to be able to anticipate rabies outbreaks, or control them, we really need to understand bat dispersal better. So like a good ecologist, I started out using classical ways of studying bat dispersal. Uh, so did a fair amount of radio telemetry in the Amazon rainforest. Uh, we've done market capture still over many years. But when it came to the radio telemetry, pretty much the most valuable thing we got out of it was ridiculous staged photos. Um, very little in terms of like understanding the foraging ecology of the bats from telemetry and that was largely because of the restricted nature of the landscape. Uh, we're either working in dense rainforest or uh, Andean mountains, which uh, block the radio signal quite efficiently. Uh, and then when it came to the mark recapture, we've had lots and lots of mark of recaptures, but they're almost always in the exact same colony where we released the bats in the first place. So that also didn't really tell us anything about bat dispersal. So instead, we've turned to a, an evolutionary approach. And the idea that we tried to use was that um, both bat DNA and viral RNA contain some information about, uh, about space and the connectivity of populations. And we reasoned that bat DNA would be telling us something about how well connected populations are. And so that might tell us something about the future geographic routes that a virus might spread. So just the virus is more likely to spread between uh, well connected bat populations. And then from the virus side, we can use um, new analytical methods that estimate the speed of viral diffusion from, from past viral sequence data. And so if we combine these two things, we've got the routes and we've got the speed, then all we, that kind of tells us something about how a future outbreak might invade across the landscape. So I'll summarize quite a lot of work <laughs> in one slide here, uh, where in order to know whether that approach was going to work, we first needed to know, well, is there actually any correspondence between bat DNA and the historical spread of rabies? And so each of these figures is going to summarize what a different genetic marker told us about the, the population structure of bats and rabies in Peru. Uh, first of all, you've got the uh, rabies virus. So each of these symbols is a different observation of rabies and the genetic type that it was associated with. And so we see that there were at least three viral genotypes circulating over the time course of this study. Um, two of them seem to be pretty widespread throughout the eastern areas of the country to the east of the, the Andes Mountains. One of them was mostly restricted to the southern part of the country in the Andes. So that's basically yeah, isolation of the coast because there's no rabies there, uh, and the southern Andes because there's a different genetic type there, but then gene flow across this whole area. We compare that to mitochondrial DNA, 
Uh, and here you're just seeing each pie chart showing the distribution of haplotypes, mitochondrial DNA haplotypes within different bat colonies. And you can see different regions have different colors. So that is basically showing us that every area has its own genetically distinct haplotype of bats, which suggests that all these areas are pretty well isolated from each other, at least according to that mitochondrial DNA marker, which as probably most of you know is maternally inherited exclusively. So if that was the real picture of bat population structure, it creates a real question of how the virus is able to spread so efficiently to the eastern part of the Andes. Um, it became a little bit more clear when we looked at the microsatellite data. So these are nuclear microsatellites. And much more similar to the viral population structure, we saw a gene flow across all this area of the, uh, to the east of the Andes. So that's the blue genotype. We saw isolation of the coast, and we saw isolation of the southern Andes. And I should mention this U, or the white one, is just un unassigned individuals, not, not a really widespread genetic group. So that's quite a lot of information, but just to break it down a little bit more, what we saw was greater population structure in the, uh, in the mitochondrial marker relative to the nuclear marker, and so that's often considered to be a signal of male bias dispersal, and we did a number, number of other tests which also confirmed that male bias dispersal is happening in this system. And we also saw this correspondence between the virus and the nuclear DNA, but not the mitochondrial DNA. And so that suggests that whatever barrier there is to female movement, which is stopping the, kind of the, the mitochondrial DNA from being well mixed, uh, that barrier seems to be permeable both to the male bats and the virus. And so our going hypothesis for what's going on here is basically that you have colonies of bats comprised of females, which are pretty much genetically isolated by female movement, but they're connected by males. And when the males connect them, they're also allowing the virus to spread between bat colonies. So that explains something about the epidemiology that we, we didn't understand before. And it also suggests the possibility that we might want to be targeting disease control towards males because they're the ones that are dispersing the virus between colonies. And that is the key uh, mechanism that prevents the virus from going extinct. So that explains something about the epidemiology, but it still doesn't tell us what, much about how we can anticipate outbreaks. So we did have one opportunity to anticipate outbreaks better, uh, and that was that we had seen this gray genotype of bats, which was present predominantly in the coast, but also uh, in the northern part of the country on the other side of the Andes. And that was super surprising because we really thought that the Andes were tall, uh, and tall enough to prevent the gene flow of bats across this mountain chain. Um, but we're picking up this signal of gene flow. And so if that was actually happening, then it creates a real public health and animal health problem because on one side of the Andes you've got rabies and on the other side of the Andes you don't. And so this opens the possibility that if there's connectivity of the bats, and we've already shown that that connectivity of bats seems to be associated with the spread of the virus, then maybe you're going to have rabies spreading across the Andes too and affecting the whole uh, Pacific coastline of South America, which currently has vampire bats but is rabies free. So we looked in an area predicted by a model uh, to be a high risk for that invasion to happen. And indeed, we saw exactly that. Uh, what you're seeing here is livestock rabies outbreaks through time. And it's probably difficult to actually see the pattern here. But uh, we, did, we fit some statistical models and found that the virus was indeed spreading at about 16 kilometers per year uh, from the east to the west. And so at this point, it's crossed the highest part of the Andes, and it's just going downhill towards the coast. So we don't really see much that's going to stop it. Uh, and then this is only the data until 2015, but if you add in the limits at 2017, it's continued to spread uh, since that paper was published. So that creates serious concerns for human and animal health, but it also creates the potential for some interesting ecological phenomenon to change. Uh, and that is because we know that the dietary ecology of these bats is different on the Pacific coast than it is in other parts of the country. Uh, we did a small study using uh, stable isotopes of so carbon and nitrogen to study the feeding behavior of the bats along the Pacific coast. And so the colors here represent three different bat colonies. And uh, what we noticed in two of those colonies was a couple of bats that had really high levels of nitrogen, which suggests that they're probably feeding on a predator. And we surmised and had a little bit of stable isotope evidence suggesting that that could be sea lions being fed upon. And that wouldn't be completely surprising because there are previous studies which have demonstrated more convincingly uh, that these bats feed on sea lions uh, along, the, or along the Pacific coast. So sea lions are a large colonial mammal, and rabies is a pretty transmissible disease that spreads by biting. Uh, 
Um, so that creates kind of the scary possibility that if you have rabies being introduced to bat populations that are feeding on sea lions, then you could start to have outbreaks of rabies in sea lions, which would be an issue for both conservation and human health. So that is lots of gloom and doom. But and on the other hand, we do now have opportunities that we didn't have before. And that's because if we can anticipate a virus when it's going to arrive in a new area, then we can try new styles of interventions. So we could be vaccinating people or livestock ahead of time, so before anyone starts dying. Or we could potentially intervene within the wild bat populations before the virus arrives, which could be more effective than interventions uh, in areas that are already infected. So as I mentioned, the vampiricide, the culling, is the main way that that's done now. But it's not all that encouraging, right, that it's, not gonna, that it's actually going to work. So what about vaccination? Right, we know from all other rabies management scenarios across the world, at least in carnivores, that vaccination has been the cornerstone for rabies prevention in humans. So here in Europe, there was, of course, uh, vaccination of foxes uh, using vaccine-laden chicken heads. Uh, and that got rid of rabies from most of Western Europe. Uh, in the east coast of the US, there's raccoon rabies vaccination using baits. And then pretty much everywhere else in, a, in the world, there's vaccination of dogs trying to eliminate rabies by 2030. So we know it works in carnivores. Why isn't it being done in bats? Well, one potential limitation is maybe we don't have vaccines, but that's certainly not true. Uh, we've had vaccines that work and protect bats, at least in captivity, uh, since 1998. And there's been kind of an evolution of these vaccines. They're getting better and better. So at the moment, we already have vaccines that can protect 70 to 100% of individuals that have consumed them. Uh, so the real challenge here is, can we move from a captive situation to a wild situation? Uh, can we actually vaccinate enough bats in the wild to make a difference? Well, we do have an opportunity here to, to diffuse the, the, the vaccine more so than just like vaccinating each bat one by one. And that would simply be to take the established mechanism for spreading vampiricide, but instead of using vampiricide, use an oral rabies vaccine. Uh, and so in this way, for every bat that you catch and treat, you're gonna be vaccinating some additional number more, but we don't know how many more, right? Um, so the question is really, would the vaccines do anything when we, if we were to release them in the wild? So we set out to test that. Uh, and this is one of the more fun studies that I've gotten to do because uh, we used basically ingestible biomarkers. So we used a, a chemical called rhodamine B, which we mixed into a gel. And the cool thing about rhodamine B is that when it's consumed by any mammal, it, it stains the hair follicles this bright fluorescent orange, at least under the UV microscope. So all we had to do was go out and treat bats with this rhodamine gel come back a couple of days later and pluck, bat, pluck hair from those bats that we recaptured. And then by looking at that hair under the microscope, we're able to work out whether or not they had consumed that rhodomy marker, which we're just taking as a proxy for have they consumed vaccine or not. So to cut a long story short, we showed that we can vaccinate, or if this was a vaccine, we could potentially be vaccinating a fairly large proportion of these bat colonies of pretty low effort. So we ended up vaccinating between 84 and 92 percent of individual bats in these colonies. And <clears throat> using some statistical inference, we estimated that each bat was probably spreading between 1.4 and 2.2 other individuals. So that's not a massive amount of spread, but it is substantial compared to just vaccinating every bat one by one. So now that we've estimated how much a vaccine might spread, we wanted to know, does that actually do anything for controlling rabies? So again, we, we kind of took the field data and tried to integrate it into a mathematical model. And so this is work that's done predominantly by another former postdoc, Kevin Baker, who's now at the University of Michigan. And we used the existing mathematical models of rabies, but we in added an extra part, which was how a vaccine would spread if it was introduced. And then we measured how effective would that be for reducing the size, duration, and probability of a rabies outbreak. And we compared if we were simulating a vaccine to simulating the current vampiricide poisoning. So one of the results is shown here, where along the x-axis, I'm showing you the proportion of the initial population that we applied uh, this mock vaccine to. So basically, it's a scale of how much effort are you going to put into it? Are you going to try to vaccinate 
or are you going to try to capture 10% or 60% or 90% of the population? And on the y-axis, you have the difference and the reduction of rabies cases comparing culling to vaccination. And so anytime the line is above that zero, that means that you reduce the size of an outbreak more by vaccination than you did by culling. So in all these cases, vaccination is favored, and in these cases, culling is favored. What's important in this case is that at the low levels of application, the ones that are probably realistically achievable in a real-world campaign, uh, vaccination is always favored and substantially so. We next looked at the probability of outbreaks, and what you're seeing here is the same x-axis, but instead you're looking at uh, the probability that an outbreak happens. So this is the proportion of simulated introductions of rabies where you had uh, kind of the virus continuing to spread. And any time you see a, colorful, uh, a color, colorful shading here, that means vaccination is outperforming culling. And any time you see gray, which is basically just right there, um, culling is outperforming vaccination. So with these two, we've got pretty good evidence that at least from this theoretical model, uh, culling is going to be outperforming vaccination, and particularly so at the low levels of application where that are probably realistic to do uh, for a management program. So we've found all this to be quite promising and we're excited to pursue this line of research more. Um, but I think the next thing we really need to know is this, is this is all thinking about rabies in a single bat colony. We need to scale that up and think about how is this actually going to work on a landscape. And so for that, we need better still spatiotemporal models of rabies transmission. Right. So that's basically what I wanted to say about the vampire bat rabies work. Um, and at this point, I'm going to shift gears quite a lot and talk about how viral genomics and machine learning can be integrated to make much broader inferences about the ecology of emerging viruses. The particular question that I wanted to answer was where do new viruses come from? Uh, as I mentioned in the beginning, a lot of our new emerging human viruses come from other animals, but working out which one of those animals has been a real challenge. Um, and that's because it's not just, you can't just go out and sample and say, okay, we found it in this animal, so it's probably coming from that individual. There's lots of possibilities of uh, an animal that's infected but isn't really all that important for transmission. Um, and so there's been a couple of papers highlighting this challenge and particularly that you really need multiple lines of evidence uh, to, to come to any conclusion about what animal is really the most important reservoir of infections. And so because you need multiple lines of evidence that usually means that this is a process that can take years or even decades to know confidently where an emerging virus is coming from. Um, so the fact that we can't do this quickly means that we slow down our ability to respond to outbreaks. Uh, we have real challenges in preventing a virus from emerging again because if you don't know where it came from the first time, you're not gonna know where it comes from the second time, so you can't really do effective surveillance. Uh, and then from a research perspective, we don't really know which animals we should be studying, so that makes it difficult to kind of understand the natural dynamics of these viruses and their natural hosts. So one source of information that I think is exploding in both the, the volume uh, and the value that it can provide is viral sequence data. So we've seen from individual outbreaks of things like Zika virus and Ebola virus that we can now basically do whole genome real-time sequencing of viruses. So a virus emerges and within days we're able to get whole genome sequences. So this has provided really important insights to understand the evolutionary history and the epidemiology of these viruses after they've jumped into humans. But what I wanted to know was can we repurpose that sequence data to learn something more about the origin of the viruses in the first place, and specifically what animal reservoir they come from or what arthropod vector might be involved in transmission. We thought that there could be at least two potential sources for uh, ecological associations embedded in viral genome sequences. The first of those was uh, the phylogeny. So we know that most of the time, closely related viruses have closely related hosts. And so we could surmise if this is a virus with an unknown host, but it's clustering within this broader clade of viruses, all of which have a bat reservoir, then a good first guess would be that this is also a bat virus. But of course, that's going to be wrong lots of times because viruses can switch between species and often across large geographic distances, sorry, large phylogenetic distances. So in some cases, that's going to be wrong. 
The second piece of information, which I'll explain a little bit more detail in the next slide, uh, is something that I'll refer to as host-associated uh, biases and viral genome composition. And so the idea here might be that there are just differences in the way that viruses encode the same proteins, uh, which could be favored by a dog, but not favored by that. So to explain why that's a reasonable thing to hypothesize, uh, it helps to understand a little bit about what I mean by genomic composition. So uh, I'll focus here on just codon pair bias, but I'm referring more broadly to other things like dinucleotide bias, codon bias. Uh, and the idea here is that there's a lot of redundancy in the genetic code. So if you want to code an, alan an alanine and a glutamic acid, there's eight different ways to do that. And the super interesting thing is that it turns out that different animals have different preferences of how they'll encode those two subsequent amino acids. And it turns out that if a virus is poorly optimized to its host, meaning that the virus is using a different sort of preferences from its host, then that reduces the fitness of the virus. So the best example of that is from human poliovirus, where uh, they took a bunch of different natural wild-type polioviruses and de-optimized them. And when they de-optimized them, they kept the amino acid sequence exactly the same, but they were just mucking around with things like the codon pair bias. And what they saw was that once you de-optimize the virus away from the biases in the human genes, you effectively attenuate it. So these viruses are no longer even able to grow efficiently on cell culture. So taking these observations together that um, the genomic biases are likely species specific uh, and viruses are optimizing their own genomes to the host that they infect, we hypothesize that the genomic traits then of the viruses should tell us something about the host or arthropod origins of the viruses in the first place. So to do that, we ended up collating a large data set of over 500 RNA viruses spanning, I think, 12 different uh, groups of viruses. And we scoured the literature and figured out what were their known reservoir hosts and arthropod vectors. Uh, importantly, we also had this black category, which we call orphan viruses. So these are ones that we don't actually know where they come from. And that'll become important later on. So we wanted to apply a machine learning approach here because we, were gonna, we knew we were going to have like thousands of genomic features, but only about 500 viruses uh, to work with. So we needed a statistical method that could account for that uh, kind of uh, situation where you have a lot of predictors, but a small number of observations. And so what we ended up using was something called gradient boosting machines. And the essential idea here is that we are taking all the viruses that have a known reservoir and we're using uh, the genome sequences of those viruses to map a function that links the sequence features that we just get from the genome to what reservoir host it comes from. And the idea was that if that worked, then we could make predictions from that model on viruses where we don't know the reservoir. So we could then take the genome of the unknown virus uh, stick it into our algorithm and see where it comes from. So we did that and it actually seemed to work pretty well. Uh, what you're seeing here is um, basically a measure of the accuracy of that model for predicting reservoir hosts. And so along the x-axis you have the predicted reservoir and on the y-axis you have the true reservoir. And so this uh, nice blue line going across the diagonal uh, is correct predictions. So across the whole data set, we're about 70% accurate, uh, which is reasonable. Of course, there's lots of room for improvement there. Um, but overall, the model does seem to be working pretty well. It worked even better when we were trying to predict uh, the arthropod, whether there's arthropod transmission at all, and if so, what sort of arthropod that might be. So in this case, we were um, about 97% accurate and almost 91% accurate. So there's a lot of potentially cool biology going on here of why are the viruses adapting uh, to, why are they adapting their genomic features uh, to these individual host groups? Um, but I'm gonna hold off on that in case anyone has questions later and just focus on how we can then apply those models. So one thing we can do is, as I said, take viruses where we had no idea where they came from and we can predict these three features of their ecology. And so one that I'll point out here is Bas Congo virus, which is a, a rhabdovirus which caused, uh, caused a, a hemorrhagic fever outbreak in the Congo, uh, but no one had any idea where it came from. It had never been seen before. And so just from the one viral genome that was available, we're able to predict with reasonable confidence that it comes from an artiodactyl, which is a, like a hooved mammal, uh, 
uh, that it is likely transmitted by an arthropod, and then that arthropod is probably some sort of biting fly like a midge. So, of course, that's not definitive, and we need to go out and validate that in the field. Um, but it's a nice way of just taking what we have, which is a genome, and making predictions that can then be tested in the wild. We also had some surprising findings, and one of those that I'll point out was e Ebola. So we, ha we included four different Ebola viruses as orphans in this data set. So these are ones that we, we weren't confident enough to assign the host. And for one of those Reston Ebola virus, we're pretty confident in a bat reservoir being predicted. Uh, for another one, Bundibogio, there was a surprising amount of primate signal in that uh, virus's genome, and a relatively low, but still somewhat there, present uh, signal of a, of a bat reservoir. And then in other cases, like Thai forest, we had pretty much equal signal between uh, primate and bat. So this illustrates first that we can make some kind of <laughs> surprising and controversial predictions, um, but also it illustrates one of the benefits, I think, of this model is that we have a lot of, we are able to include an estimate of uncertainty. So what you're seeing like, in a case like this is that we, we really don't know for sure. Uh, we're highlighting potential alternative hosts, but we do at least incorporate the uncertainty of the models. We're not saying this is the only prediction that you have to work with. So it kind of gives you a candidate list to be thinking about. So we are currently working on turning this into a web, uh, a, like a web server-based application, and hopefully that will be up soon. But we really think it has some potential to be guiding uh, kind of longer-term surveillance, so knowing where we should be investing some effort into finding out what is the real reservoir, uh, and also you know, directing what animals we should be doing research on. So. Um, to summarize all that, uh, for the vampire bat rabies work, we've tried to show how kind of incorporating ecology and evolution can inform our decisions about how we go about doing management of an important virus for human health and agriculture. Uh, in particular, we showed the kind of uncertainty over whether culling is an effective strategy, and that seems to arise from the sporadic presence of the virus. Uh, rather than being kind of endemically there all the time at some low level, it seems like it's really popping up uh, as a result of bat dispersal. So that's pointing us in some direction of how to better predict those outbreaks. And the most recent work has provided some encouraging evidence that self-spreading vaccines could be uh, an effective strategy to, to mitigate the burden of that disease in Latin America. And then in the second part of the talk, which I just mentioned, uh, we've shown the surprising power um, that we can achieve by taking publicly available genomic data sets and combining them with new powerful methods in machine learning. And so I think we've done a bit of work there, but there's still quite a lot more to do. Uh, and I'm particularly interested in seeing what else can we predict from just viral genome sequences, because this is such a ubiquitous and easily obtained set of data. So with that, I will thank a bunch of people in the group that were responsible for the work, uh, particularly Kevin, who did the modeling of vaccine spread, and Julio, who led the project on uh, the large-scale intervention in Peru. And I'll also thank my funders for support and various people around Peru that have helped with this project over many years that it's run. So thank you very much. <laughs>